Okay, so now we're going to take a quick recap of the area of capital investment and the time value of money. And so in this example, we're going to start with a very brief discussion of cost types and cost behaviors. And so basically, we usually try to divide costs under a number of different headings. And so you do obviously have things like controllable costs, fixed variable and semi-variable, which we'll look at my favorite little diagram of in a second, and um, other areas. The area I wanted to just focus in on for a second is the area of relevant costs. So these are costs that uh, may or may not have an impact on the decision. And the key issue is, w in terms of deciding whether they have an impact on the decision, is whether they would change based on the decision being made. So if we have, for example, costs that have already been spent and the decision whether or not to take a project will not affect those costs in any way, then in that situation, we'll probably still uh, or we'll probably ignore those costs because there's no point in worrying about them because they're not going to change if we make the decision. There's three basic types of costs. So the first one we're going to talk about is just a fixed cost, and that is a cost that doesn't change with activity. So do, um, the cost remains the same. So you can see it's a straight line there um, that just stays parallel to the axis here. The second one is a variable cost, and this is a cost that changes directly with activity. So if we do nothing at all, or we produce zero in quantity terms, we have no cost, and then it goes up directly in proportion to the amount or to the quantity of what we've done. And then the third area we have is what's referred to as a semi-variable cost. And these are costs that have a fixed element to them. In other words, no matter what we do, we're gonna spend a certain amount, and so that's what that, the, the fact that the um, the line on the graph doesn't actually intersect at zero um, means that there's always going to be some cost, but then after that, it goes up directly in line with activity. So, And we see that happening on an ongoing basis. So a very quick example, we fab foods with three freezer display units um, that were purchased three years ago for 20,000 euro each. Book value is currently 8,000. The, in this case, the company has to buy three new freezers because the current ones don't meet certain health and safety guidelines that they need to meet with. And so the options that are available to the company are, number one, sell the existing freezers for €4,000 each, or number two, improve the freezers at a cost of €5,000, at which time they can be sold for €10,000 each. So the issues we have to consider, first and foremost, we think about the fact that they cost us originally 60,000 euro. So that's one issue. The current value on the books or in our accounts is 24,000 euro. We can sell them for 12,000 euro if we don't do anything with them, uh, or they can be sold for 30,000 euro if we spend 15,000 on them. And so in terms of the basis of the decision, fundamentally, the question is going to be, what will give us the most economically advantageous outcome in this scenario? And so in order to work that out, we need to work out what is important to us. So the first thing is that the fact that the freezers costed six cost 60,000 originally is irrelevant, doesn't matter to our current decision-making process. The fact that they're currently worth 18,000 euro in our books is also not something that is really relevant to what we're doing at the moment. Again, that's an accounting transaction. It doesn't have any impact on our decision that we're taking at the moment. The only two issues that arise is that either they can be sold uh, for 12,000 euro unaltered or they can be sold for 30,000 euro if improved. Okay, And so, again, based on an economic consideration, we know that we can sell them without improvement. The net gain in that situation is 12,000 euro. And if we improve them and sell them for 15,000, we'll have a net gain of 15,000. So in that scenario, the most economically advantageous approach is to improve them for 15,000 and then sell them for 15,000 later on. And so it's important to understand that this is all about decision making. And so a number of key issues jump in when we think about this area then. The first one is the fact that money loses value over time or another wa way of looking at it is that it buys less over periods of time occasionally it goes up you can see the great depression there but most of the time it follows a downward track where it goes down over time 
Um, the dollar, as an example, since 1900 has lost over 95% of its value. In other words, um, it buys 95% less now than it did in 1900. And so the first thing is that if we're making a decision over a fairly lengthy period of time, more than a year or two, then the I there is a significant potential impact on the project by the fact that this actually happens. Okay, And so if you compare different cash flows, you're obviously going to end up, um, if you look a number of years ahead, where the cash flow mightn't give you the same. If it was a simple 5%, you would lose um, about 7, or about, sorry, I was going to say 78, about 22% of the value over a five-year period. And so you can see that it has to be taken into account. When we're trying to make investment appraisals, there's a couple of things we have to think about. Number one, they involve cash going out, and usually there's an initial cash outlay as well. Number two, we have to think about the returns. Number three, it's concerned with a long-term decision. So we're not just looking at a short period of time. We're looking at multiple years, probably at least three years and maybe as many as six or seven or ten, depending on the nature of the project. We have to use relevant costs. So if we're making a decision, the costs that change whether or not we, we decide to take on the project are the only costs that are relevant in this case. And then we have to choose potentially between alternative projects and we have to have a mechanism for choosing between those projects and therefore in order to make those selections we will end up using certain financial evaluation techniques very quickly in terms of the different types that are out there two non-discounting ones which are considered lesser of lesser importance in modern finance uh, the first one is the payback period which is the time for a, a capital investment to be uh, recouped um, it's based on pre-depreciation uh, profits, um, and the aim is to look at the, what surplus is made over a period of time. So in this example here, the project initially cost 50000 and over the three years, we're going to get 25000 in the first year, 20000 in the second year, and fifteen in the third. So year one, we still have to pay 25000 Year two, we still owe 5000 and it's only in year three that we actually earn some money um and therefore we have an issue at that point the issue also is that if we're looking at it from a liquidity standpoint um it can be useful if it pays back quickly but it doesn't consider the return generated over the whole life of the project and also doesn't take into account the time value of money the second one very quickly is the accounting rate of return and the arr is the estimated profit uh, or estimated average profit divided by the estimated average investment multiplied by 100. And in this case, the profit includes depreciation and the average investment is the average book value of the assets in a year. And it's evaluated either over a year or over the life of the project. Okay, so if we have an asset that cost us uh, 160,000 euro, has a life of four years, that may, uh, and we know that we have a profit of €40,000 from the project, we can work out the accounting rate of return. So the average investment, if it's 160000 over four years, that's 40000 a year. The average profit, therefore, is if the profit from the total project is 40000 and again, four years gives us 10000 and therefore the accounting rate of return is the 10,000 divided by the 40,000, which is a 25% return in this example. Uh, again, number of issues. The biggest one is the, is the, are the related issues of profit and depreciation. And so because profit is based on accounting policies and financial policies, as is depreciation, it means that it can be manipulated in certain ways. And it also ignores the time value of money. Now, so that the present value or and future value approach, therefore, is the one we're looking at. And so if we look at this, what we're going to do is discount our cash flows from the, f the f future value, the amounts we say are going to come in, to the present values. And so we're going to use this formula to actually do that, although in an exam scenario, we're more likely to use tables. And so in order to do the discounted cash flow calculation, the first issue we consider is the time value of a euro um, and we consider other issues on top of that then. So, for example, we want, might want to make an additional return. So we will probably choose a discount rate that's much higher than 
the um, the cost of capital to us. So in this example, we have a scenario whereby we're applying a discount rate um, in terms of these, and what you find is you get a cash flow that arrives in on each of those. Another consideration is the internal rate of return as an issue, and that is where you work out where the cash flows, the discount rate at which the cash flows will work out to be zero. So it's an internal, you can see there, in terms of, of, of how it works. Um, you apply the formula, it gives you the answer. Again, you need, in order to do this, you need two net present value computations. One that gives you a positive value and the other that gives you a negative value. And so you can see those there. And when you have those actually worked out, um, you end up in a scenario whereby you can work out at what percentage the uh, cash return would be zero in this case. A couple of things to bear in mind with regards to use of the internal rate of return. Um, it is not a way to choose between projects. So it's not something you would ever use to choose between two projects. Um, it's usually used as a hurdle rate instead and may be used alongside net present value to solidify the decision that you're actually trying to take.